we have uh, the pleasure of hosting uh, Professor Vittorio Gallese uh, from the Department of Neuroscience of the University of uh, Parma. Maybe the, just to get started, uh, I would like uh, you, if you could comment on um, the issue of the relationship between perception and, and, and movement. We tend to uh, consider uh, these two aspects of uh, human physiology or neurophysiology as completely separate channels, but uh, there is more and more evidence uh, that actually these uh, these two modalities uh, go together and in fact they, they uh, really are also, and maybe we will get to this point later on, uh, uh, their interaction is part of the aesthetic experience. So uh, if you could just, let's start with this yes, I can very say that broad it's point. It's also important for psych psychoanalysis but because for Freud it was the perception pole of the psychic apparatus and the motor pole. And these two dimensions were present at the beginning of the Freud right. writings. Um, well, a, a, a traditional way of thinking about this issue is to conceive of the brain as a, a, a machine uh, that on the one hand organizes the motor output, so that's the part of the brain that does things, then there is a part of the brain that perceives things, and finally a part of the brain uh, that uh, knows things. And uh, the late philosopher Susan Hurley described this uh, uh, view of the brain with the metaphor of the sandwich. So you have action and perception uh, imagined as two slices of bread, and the feeling, according to your taste, uh, the most interesting part of the sandwich would be cognition. So about 30 years of uh, neuroscientific research are showing us a completely different picture. So I am perhaps uh, way too radical in, in this respect. I was trained as a, a, a motor neurophysiologist, so perhaps I tend to overemphasize the role of, uh, of the motor system, but uh, uh, if you allow me uh, to squeeze it in a, in a couple of words, I would dare to say that perhaps perception is a modality of action. To, definitely, they are uh, very much intertwined. So it is really hard to find uh, a sharp uh, dividing line that separates action from perception and both from cognition. Mm -hmm. So, um, just following up on this, maybe <clears throat> you're also quite uh, famous <clears throat> with your um, colleague uh, Giacomo Rizzolatti for having discovered uh, a feature of the brain which is really occupying uh, and attracting a lot of interest and, and was instrumental in better understanding the relationship between perception and, and, and action. And, and this is the <clears throat> mirror neuron system. Right. So maybe just also up update us on this, I think it will be of interest just to have this as a background, because it's been really a major step forward in understanding this sensory yeah. motor integration. Uh, we were studying um, macaque monkey's premotor cortex, uh, but uh, we were studying that part of the motor brain in a very peculiar way. We were studying visual responses from motor neurons, mm -hmm. so that's uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, so you, sorry to interrupt, so you were already yes. into this yeah. uh, visual I motor mean, in this case, I mean, or uh, perception and, and, and motion and, and motor system. It's entirely true that uh, we weren't looking for mirror neurons, so we discovered them uh, by chance. Mm -hmm. But I always add that it was not a chance that we discovered them. Uh, in the sense that we were <laughs> we were ready to see them. We were already studying uh, the motor uh, system, the cortical motor system, from a pretty unorthodox uh, uh, point of view, uh, because we already discovered another class of neurons, what we uh, normally refer to as canonical neurons, the neurons that translate uh, the shape of that glass into the motor program suitable mm -hmm. to interact with the same object. So they uh, mm -hmm. carry on uh, uh, what we call a visual motor transformation. 
And while uh, investigating the, the functional properties of, of these uh, neurons, we discovered that some neurons uh, didn't uh, fire when we expected them to, to fire, mm -hmm. to respond, as we say. Uh, namely, not when we show the object to the monkey, but uh, a little before. And exactly when we grasp the object in order to show it to the monkey. Mm -hmm. So at first we were rather surprised and very skeptical. So we, we spent uh, many months in uh, ruling out alternative interpretations. So we recorded EMG, the activity of the muscles of the hand, just to uh, be sure that uh, uh, those responses with uh, no apparent movement were really uh, due to the uh, perception of, of the action and not to some uh, attempted uh, movement on, on the monkey's side. So basically, this neuron epitomizes uh, this integrative uh, function of the motor system. So maybe just practically, can you say, essentially, these neurons fire when the animal sees a movement? Exactly. The same neuron that the, fires when uh, the they, monkey grasps yeah, exactly. the peanut will fire also when the monkey is observing someone else uh, grasping the peanut. And we later on discovered that even the noise of a peanut being broken evoke the response of exactly. the very same oh, neurons. It's also so it's a kind of abstract uh, way yeah. of uh, uh, treating actions. So yes, it's an ab abstract way. Yes. And uh, your choice of the metaphor of mirror, what, what, how was your choice? Because producing this metaphor, it will, it, it's a very powerful metaphor. It's very powerful indeed, although on, on the one hand, uh, on the other, it doesn't entirely capture the, the functional properties of this mechanism. It is powerful because, and it came up to, to our mind because it was the easiest translation mm -hmm. of what we were observing. So there is one neuron that does basically the same thing because when you record a single neuron, you record the output of the neuron. So the neuron is speaking the same word both when the monkey does something, but also when the monkey is uh, looking at someone else doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the visual response mirrors the motor one. Yes, but, but your choice of mirror, it was an immediate choice or it was after discussion? No, no, I, I, I went through the protocols. Uh, we were very meticulous in uh, writing down the properties of the neuron that we were testing uh, at the beginning. And it came after a few months. Okay. The first description is very complex visual motor neuron. That's, cool. that's the way we describe yeah. it uh, at the beginning. But on the other hand, I think um, uh, we, in the first place, are very peculiar mirrors. Uh, I mean, uh, primates and particularly humans, uh, while mirroring others, we metabolize uh, uh, what we see on the basis of our own identity. And the same applies to, to this class of neurons. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a set of motor experience, most likely your neuron will be ready to respond to something that is congruent with what you did before. Mm -hmm. uh, so as long as you uh, develop new motor skill, uh, the uh, responsiveness of this class of neuron mm -hmm. will also change. While uh, a mirror is a reflecting surface that uh, uh, can only reflect what you put in front of it. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the case of mirror neurons, the system has a high degree of plasticity. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. that, so th the idea is that, in a way, to uh, embody or to absorb <coughs> an experience, yes. a perceptive experience, you somehow have to reproduce it virtually in the motor system? Yeah. Uh, I, I like to call it uh, a simulation. A simulation. So your, your motor system behaves um, uh, in a way very similarly when you, when you do something, when you imagine yeah. doing something, and after the discovery of mirror neurons, we can add also when you observe someone else doing the same thing. So acting, imagining to act, and observing someone else acting, 
to a certain degree, all share the same uh, neural networks. And we can see also thinking. Well, that's a big jump. <laughs> it depends on how yeah, you I know define. That it is a big jump. Uh, yeah. But, uh, how you define thinking? Well, uh, thinking if, or, or or the meaning or perhaps the language, the the signifier. I don't know. Well, I, I, another I, instantiation where we see the activation of this mechanism, uh, for example, is when you read about an action. Mm. If I read a sentence describing uh, a bodily action, that leads to the activation of part of the same circuit that are also active when you act or when you see someone else acting. Yeah. So since language uh, is part of the story, uh, then definitely this mechanism, uh, I think, has something to do with uh, our cognitive life. I have, then I let you ask more psychoanalytical questions, but I have a, a neurobiological question. Yes. And that is, uh, <clears throat> obviously, because these neurons uh, can uh, both, uh, in a way, uh, uh, are activated by a perception, and at the same time they are those right. that are activated by a, a motor, uh, when they, there is a motor performance. How do you view this idea that neurons are able of very high uh, integration and computational powers, the extreme of this being the grandmother neuron or yeah. the Jennifer Aniston neuron, you know, yes. uh, uh, what I can, uh, you know, just to, to, to explain for those who are listening to us, the, the, this notion of this Jennifer Aniston neuron is a neuron that it's actually during pre-operative recordings in a person who was working in Hollywood, uh, he, this neuron, the, uh, the, the, the electrode would be activated by the presentation of the picture of Jennifer Aniston, but not other blondes, uh, by the voice, the voice as well, um, yeah. by mentioning just the name Jennifer mm -hmm. Aniston. So uh, some people, and we know uh, these are colleagues that we know well, uh, have somehow pushed the idea and say this neuron integrates um, everything around uh, this this concept, whereas the other view is that actually this neuron may be part of a neuronal network that contributes to uh, the representation yeah. of Jennifer Aniston. So where do you position these uh, um, mirror neurons in relationship to these properties? Well, no, no neuron is an island, so to speak. Uh, so the functional property of each neuron are the outcome of the uh, integration that that specific neuron operates uh, on the variety of inputs it receives. So all the properties of any kind of neurons are the outcome of the integrative uh, work that neuron carries out. So this applies to Jennifer Aniston's selective neuron uh, and to mirror neurons uh, as well. Uh, for many years, uh, we, we had uh, uh, this sort of debate. It was either uh, everything uh, uh, built or coded by uh, highly uh, integrated, uh, highly selective uh, single neurons, the, the metaphor of, or, or of the grandmother cell, or conversely, it was totally uh, the outcome of uh, a large distributed neural network. I think you, you, you need both. Mm -hmm. So indeed, what I always found remarkable uh, is that if you, if you go to the visual system, the percentage of highly selective neurons uh, in, in the human brain uh, uh, very closely resemble the percentage of highly selective uh, neuron that you can record in the macaque monkey brain, which is about 30%. So you have, of course, uh, distributed networks of, of, of neurons, but nevertheless, this network produce uh, super neurons, if you want to call them uh, uh, in such a way, uh, neurons that uh, anyway are, uh, have uh, a superior degree of integration because most likely they, um, they are adaptive, so they, they speed up. Uh, the processing uh, in a variety of domains. And you think that these super neurons are the product of uh, plasticity? Yeah, definitely. Of experience? Of, of experience, yeah. of, of uh, everyday experience and uh, of uh, 
Hebbian, Hebbian yeah, learning, yeah, 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 exactly. the typical Classic uh, associative uh, mechanism uh, we know about. Yeah. I had a question about uh, psychoanalysis, but it's more a general question about the question of time. Mm -hmm. Because we have, with your description, a coincidence between action and visualization, visualization of action. Yes. And it's something like a synchrony a synchronic moment between visualization, perception, and action. Yeah. And uh, this notion is outside the idea of time, or it's creating time, uh, aboli an abolition of time. <laughs> what is your idea of time with the metaphor or the fact of the mirror neuron system? This is a difficult question. <laughs> I know, but I was all, always To be honest, asking I, never, me. I never thought um, uh, about the relationship between the notion of time. The, the, the type of time the, the physiologist uh, is normally uh, involved with uh, deals with latency, uh, how many milliseconds after stimulus onset did the neuron start responding? Mm. Uh, uh, I think you you are referring to something uh, uh, way more complex, uh, 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 existential time, the time of experience. Uh, yes, perhaps. perhaps, but it's difficult for me also to answer you know, because time is also representation of time. Yeah. And psychic time is a representation of something that we don't know, finally. But the idea of synchronic coincidence between, I don't know, seeing some bo someone uh, uh, breaking a peanut, yeah. or hearing someone breaking a peanut, or breaking a peanut, yeah. or hearing the word peanut. Yeah. And th these examples are uh, central on a synchrony. Something, I don't know if it is a coincidence, a synchrony, or something which is without time. And uh, the idea of mirror is also a metaphor of something wi without, yeah. uh, without gap, without... Uh, uh, although, again, the metaphor uh, can be slightly misleading, uh, uh, in the sense that... Um, when a mirror neuron fire when I am the agent, uh, it would normally uh, um, uh, display a higher activity with respect to when I see someone else. So the, the mechanism already introduces a mm. difference between acting and observing someone else acting. So the, out, the overlap uh, uh, um, is never complete. And to add more, the anticipatory power of the neuron most likely is higher when you act. Uh, in other words, the onset of the discharge of the neuron with respect to when you actively execute the action uh, is... Uh, um, more anticipatory with respect to when you see the action of someone else, okay. which is in turn uh, more anticipatory uh, for obvious reason with respect uh, to when uh, you have only access to the noise of the action, uh, like the, the, mm. the noise produced by the peanut being broken, where the response can only occur after the, the sound, uh, after the sound. Uh, has been uh, perceived. Oh, While in the case of the observation, the neuron most of the time will fire before the mm. hand actually grasps. Okay. So the neuron is ahead of goal accomplishment. But and it's, we it's believe something like time mind from Libet's uh, <laughs> idea of uh, yeah. small delay. It's a small gap. Well, yeah. talk, essentially, what you're bringing up is the, are we aware or not uh, of the of the time yes, and is it an automatic exactly. uh, phenomena with a synchronic dimension, like reflex? I don't know. Uh, well, the small uh, structure of yeah. a reflex. I said reflex like uh, automatic, uh, direct. Uh, these are all adjectives that. Uh, 
um, recur in the uh, literature on mirror neurons. Although um, this automaticity uh, can be uh, controlled top down, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there is evidence that uh, uh, we can act uh, consciously, most likely, or sometimes unconsciously, and uh, uh, this automaticity can be modulated. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is not necessarily always an all or nothing phenomenon uh, on the basis of the context in which the action takes place or mm -hmm. uh, where you are and, and etc. Maybe uh, I, we can bring in a, a, one of the dimensions of perception and it would be interesting to see how that in interacts with yeah. emotion system that's emotion yes i mean ha, uh, perception often uh, are um, or generate an emotion or are they actually generate changes in the bodily states yeah. according to james theory and and therefore uh, create an emotion and how how does uh, emotion come into play in this uh, sensory motor inte uh, right. integration? So from the very beginning, um, I had the impression that uh, what we discovered uh, might uh, have been uh, just uh, the tip of a much bigger iceberg, so to speak. So the idea was the the hypothesis, the suspect was that uh, action mirroring could be just one instantiation of uh, uh, a more general mirroring mechanism that uh, uh, could be applied also to sensations, uh, emotions. So the next step, and, and indeed with Alvin Goldman, who's a philosopher of mind, in, in 2000 we ventured to speculate that uh, one could, could have discovered perhaps mirroring also in the domain of emotion, and, and, and this turned out to be the case. Uh, we published a paper uh, with Bruno Wicker in Marseille uh, about this gust, where we were able to show that the, the very same part of the brain that uh, is active when I subjectively experience this gust is also active when I witness the facial expression of someone else being exactly. disgusted. Then we apply the same logic uh, to uh, touch, tactile sensation. Mm -hmm. And again, with uh, Christian cases, uh, we show it that uh, the second somatosensory area, uh, which is by no means confined to the processing of uh, tactile stimuli, it's a multimodal uh, integrative area, like the whole brain, I would add. Uh, multimodality is the rule, it's not the exception. So this part of the brain that is active when uh, uh, my hand is touched, turns out to be active also when I see the hand of someone else being mm -hmm. touched. And the same applies to pain. So that's why I introduced the notion of embodied simulation. It was an attempt to provide a, a theoretical framework that could uh, explain all these varieties of uh, mirroring uh, phenomena that probably uh, are different instantiation of a basic functional mechanism of our brain, which is uh, uh, the functional mechanism of uh, uh, embodied simulation. That, that's my idea. Yes, it's very interesting. The difficult question is the generalization yeah. from the neuron, mirror neuron, mirror neuron uh, system, yeah. and the matching mirror system of the brain uh, in cognition and emotion. It's a, yeah. Something like a big, uh, to discuss, I think, that right. a big jump. <laughs> well, one thing we, we, we know still very little is specifically how all of these dimensions are integrated by our brain-body system. Uh, for very good reasons, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, at least I uh, approach these uh, fascinating topics uh, um, with the sort of... Uh, uh, methodological reductionism. So these complex entities have to be deconstructed, uh, have to be uh, made uh, uh, simpler. So we study the motor system, then we, in another experiment we study emotion, in a third experiment we study touch or pain, but there's no action divorced from emotion, there's no sensation divorced from 
its affective quality. So the, uh, the challenge is to recompose the mosaic. And indeed, exactly. what we are uh, trying to do is to inject the affective dimension both to action and to sensations, because, mm -hmm. um, as I said, our phenomenal experience uh, is fully integrated. So I don't see an action, and then I provide, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, an emotional narrative. Uh, uh, the emotion and the action uh, all come at once in my perceptual experience. So, and this is the root of your interest for aesthetic. Yes, that's one one root. Another root is that uh, you can approach aesthetics from the point of view of the brain uh, in order to satisfy a variety of questions. And indeed, uh, there are many different approaches. So we call it neuroaesthetics, but neuroaesthetics covers a, a huge variety of approaches. Uh, why I am interested in neuroesthetic in the first place because I think that uh, aesthetic experience is a, a very interesting uh, offers a very interesting opportunity to study um, the varieties of possible world we all constantly inhabit. So we have the the, uh, the idea is that uh, reality is one thing. Fiction is a different thing, uh, but if you consider that uh, already uh, when you compare an executed action with an imagined action, uh, the difference at the level of the brain is much less sharp uh, than one uh, would think about. Um, so I think there is a sort of dimensionality that distinguishes The, the variety of worlds that we uh, inhabit or that we can potentially inhabit. So aesthetic experience uh, is, um, uh, provides a very good uh, uh, a case to be, to be studied empirically. And uh, ironically enough, uh, the vast majority of experiment that we are doing in order to understand how we represent the real world are done employing uh, representa fi fictional representation of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the experiment of disgust, we hired uh, actors that were inhaling the content of a glass and they were pretending to be disgusted. Mm -hmm. But there was not the real disgust. It was an active disgust. Mm -hmm. So you study fiction to understand <clears throat> reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, to study mm -hmm. fiction as such, Uh, I think will uh, broaden our idea about uh, what what reality is all about. So that's the main. Uh, have you used avatars uh, to? Uh, no, not yet. Do you think it would bring something or to your studies? Well, yes. I mean, by I, using. I'm mentioning this because this is a, a way of fiction. It's virtual reality. Yes. Yes. And so if you see in a virtual reality environment someone being hit, for example, but it's not a human being, it's an avatar, you think it will activate... Uh... Yeah, uh, and uh, with the development of the new digital technology, I think uh, it will be possible, it is already possible, but it will be uh, even uh, more interesting uh, uh, in the near future. Uh, the big advantage of this virtual uh, uh, approach is that you can uh, quantify much better Uh, all yes. the variables at right. stake. Right. Right. While it's really hard to, right. to, to tell an actor to perform exactly in the same uh, way or uh, oh, by so introducing yes. some. Through, through mirror neural, neuron system, the objectal other, I don't know how to say it, yeah. the other, yes. the other other, yes. becomes another self. Yes. And we have the, the question of avatar really inside the, the, the question of the mirror neuron yeah. uh, system. Exactly. It's a, like a transitivism in, yes. the, in, in, in psychoanalysis. This When is very... you, you, you are the same than the other in the process of becoming. Yeah. This is a very crucial point, uh, uh, the one you touched. Um, uh, I am becoming more and more inclined to think that Instead of thinking about uh, an individual self 
uh, that uh, eventually uh, learn how to cope with the other, mm -hmm. uh, I, I start being convinced that we are born with the other and uh, we learn to become who we are. Exactly. So we learn to become uh, a self. I agree completely. I am a psychoanalyst, Lacanian psychoanalyst, and from mirror uh, yeah. stage. It's the idea that we become, we are first the same. Etage and du miroir. Un, a stade du miroir. Stade du miroir. Yes. We are first the same, and after we become different. Yeah. And, and, unique. Uh, and unique. And unique, yes. Lucky me. <laughs> but um, maybe, I mean, this is a very important point, uh, but maybe we can go back to the aesthetic experience yes. and, and also some, um, some aspects uh, that were encapsulated in the work of uh, Abi Varbo, yes. which I know you share, and maybe it would be nice yes. to bring it on we, we share an in the discussion. We share for yes. Abi Warburg and the different concept of Abi Warburg yeah. work. And I read your paper about Abi Warburg was for me very important. And perhaps you can uh, say something about that because it's appreciation of art and also creation of art and the question of pathos formal yes. in uh, the work of Abi Warburg, which oh. is an integration between representation and emotion. Exactly. Something like that. Uh, what really uh, fascinates me uh, about Abi Warburg is that Warburg... Uh, didn't set any disciplinary boundary uh, to pursue his own uh, mm -hmm. cultural and scholar interest. Uh, one of the books that uh, was most influential for developing uh, his ideas about uh, aesthetics and art history was the expression of emotion uh, in men and uh, the animals by Charles Darwin. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he wrote in his... Uh, uh, a diary, uh, uh, finally a book that really helps me. And uh, I think we should um, make it explicit that uh, the boundaries between the two cultures, science on the one hand, uh, uh, the humanities on the other, we should really leave it behind. And uh, we should mutually enrich our perspective by uh, having a uh, a very uh, uh, cooperative dialogue uh, with people uh, from other uh, disciplines. Uh, a multiple perspective uh, uh, has great chances to enrich uh, the debate and what is at stake. And the notion of pathos formal is a beautiful example on how uh, uh, an art historian who uh, uh, reads biology, who reads physiology, uh, herring, uh, uh, for example, uh, in a very creative way can exploit uh, 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 those uh, uh, cultural and scientific stimuli uh, to develop uh, a theory about uh, art history, but even more importantly, a, a theory about human nature. Yeah. And uh, so the idea that uh, uh, there are some biological constraints the way we move, for example, when we are uh, experiencing a given emotion that, that resurfaces many times along the, uh, um, the history of art, uh, it's uh, a very interesting intuition, which um, is very interesting also for the neuroscientist. Exactly. Or the psychoanalyst. They were, they were he was bridging biology uh, psychology, yes. f for me, psychoanalysis yes. with, 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 uh, in the same time, and also uh, history, history of art, art creation. It yeah. is. But so this analysis of movement and expressions that are constant throughout representation, artistic representations, so you would, uh, in a, maybe um, being reductionistic, you would uh, consider this as being uh, put by the biological constraints. I mean, people, uh, I mean, why humans would express disgust uh, in a certain way, and it's essentially across cultures is like this, or why uh, yeah. happiness essentially, uh, I mean, there are these constants across cultures and probably across 
across time. Yeah. And and how, is that the case or not? I mean, I mean uh, again, uh, I mean, we tend to frame these uh, issues in either or uh, uh, cognitive frame. Mm-hmm. So it's either biology or culture. It's exactly. innate or it's socially or culturally constructed. Mm-hmm. My point is that we live in the century of epigenetics. So epigenetics mm. is showing that uh, gene expression can be not only modulated by the environment, but the outcome of this modulation can be passed to, to the offspring. So we are almost back to Lamarck in a way. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I, I find very, uh, uh, very reductive uh, uh, to say, well, but then uh, if it is universal, how do we account exactly. uh, for cultural diversity? Well, it's both. Yes, I have the impression that for Warburg, the question was not why, but how. How, yes. And how was his theory of memory yeah. uh, through uh, memory and evolution? Yes. Richard uh, S- um, Simon. Yeah. Simon. Drew, yes. Simon. Simon. Richard Simon. And he was uh, influenced by Darwin. Yeah and the theory of Engram, and the theory of Mneme. Yeah. And Mneme was after, for Warburg, Mnemosyne, like right. the god in the Greek uh, culture. And the idea was more the plasticity of memory, or epigenetic, yeah. or environment, than the question of an universal roots of expression. Right, mm-hmm. it's it's so, right. How yeah, that connects with the the aesthetic experience. But for for uh, I ask, for for Warburg, it was for one part Nachleben. Yes, uh, a term that you yes, like. <laughs> I like Nachleben uh, in English. How do it's difficult uh, because in French, uh, it, 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 no, no. It, yes, for me it's more Nachleben is really to live something after. Okay. But for in French, it was translated by survivance. Survivance. And survivance, for me, it's not the same thing. I don't know in English or the translation uh, of Nachleben. To, to leave something with a delay, yes. an important delay. Nachleben, uh, mnemosine, yes. pathos formal, and the link was through pathos formal, the, the, really through the... the, the Integration, yeah. embodiment of expression, representation, and emotion. Right. So the, the 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 person who looks at an art uh, is actually experiencing the same as the one who has produced it, or not necessarily. Well, uh, in a way, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a very old intuition. I mean, we uh, we. We kept the body and emotion out of the aesthetic debate for nearly more than 50 years. It was all representational, propositional, uh, linguistically mediated. Uh, uh, now I, I, I see that um, uh, the body is striking back, so yes. to speak, uh, and more and more um, uh, scholars in, in, the, in aesthetics uh, uh, look back and discover that uh, uh, many many other scholars in the past, uh, we were talking uh, um, about them just before starting, uh, Robert Fischer, uh, Wölflin, uh, um, von Hildebrandt, uh, many others uh, um, emphasized uh, the role uh, of uh, bodily experience uh, in the aesthetic experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that goes on when you behold uh, art. And I think the body is relevant also uh, uh, in the creative act uh, on the side of the artist. Uh, not necessarily in the sense that the artist uh, uh, consciously uh, produces the artwork being aware that that specific gesture that produces uh, that sign will evoke uh, an equivalent uh, simulated response uh, uh, I mean, you don't need to, to, to envisage such a scenario. I think it, it's, it's probably mostly unconscious, but what makes an artist a great, a great artist yeah. is probably also the capacity to uh, uh, 
being attuned with the bodily reaction that his work exactly. will awaken. Uh, For example, the awake. Nymphea Fiorentina, mm -hmm. the Ghirlandaio. Yes. Ghirlandaio in Santa Maria Novella. Santa Maria yes. Novella. Nymphea Fiorentina, it's also action, it's a movement. Definitely. Yes, it's an impression, and he, Warburg was all his life working on Ninfea Fiorentina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a kind for, of for you, what, what is the, it's the movement inside the representation? What is the? the it's the movement, the but pathos the, formal from Ninfea yeah. Fiorentina. The movement uh, uh, in itself uh, um, also combines uh, an emotional quality. Exactly. An emotional quality that uh, has uh, an impact on the beholder. So you can read uh, uh, an artwork uh, at, at a variety of different uh, levels of description. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I had uh, once um, um, a discussion with uh, an Italian philosopher, and his point was challenging the idea that embodiment. Uh, plays a role in aesthetic experience, uh, uh, he was um, using as an example uh, uh, Printemps uh, by Botticelli, mm -hmm. La Primavera del Botticelli. And his point was uh, the real meaning of this painting has been uh, revealed uh, only very recently. It has nothing to do with nature. It has nothing to do with spring. Uh, it's uh, a way uh, Botticelli employed to metaphorically envisage uh, a reform of the course of study in, in Florence. Uh, and this might be uh, entirely true, but it doesn't subtract anything from the personal experience I might enjoy when looking at the painting, being totally unaware, as the vast majority of the people, by the way, uh, going to the Uffizi, yeah. who still marvel with this artwork, without knowing what's the specific meaning uh, that Botticelli wanted to convey when... Uh, because the meaning can also be relativized. Uh, I mean, that's... Have, have, you have you studied the mnemosine? Uh, Not deeply, uh, the atlas. Yeah, yeah the atlas. Yeah. Be, be, because Some it tables, will be yes. uh, the, the table. And, and we probably wish should reach a conclusion, but uh, can you say a couple of words about Nemosin? Nemosin, well, for, for Warburg, uh, he tried to associate different representation in paintings, in sculpture of different times. Yes. And they were in, uh, to, together. Arranged in a thematic, uh, yes. thematic fashion. Yes. yes, in a thematic fashion. It's difficult to understand it was what he was looking for, but it's perhaps something which will be possible to study through the idea of movement, action, perception, yeah, right. uh, matching together something which was for him important. But yeah. for, for me, it's very mysterious. But I have the impression that we can study with your point of view and with the biology of today, yeah. With a, a new, have a new gaze on the work of uh, Abi Warburg. Right. The, the point I would like to stress is that a, neuro, a cognitive neuroscientific approach to art, to literature, to visual arts, to uh, theater, to cinema, is not an imperialistic stance that tells people, well, you, you know about uh, the psychoanalytic approach, forget about it you know, about uh, the philosophical uh, approach, uh, uh, forget about it. Now we have the real thing, the brain, uh, and please enjoy it. No, this, <laughs> this, is not, this is not the point. I think the neurobiological dimension can, uh, to a certain degree, integrate and enrich all these right, exactly. uh, other perspectives. Uh, 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 we, we, and this so is going to be the future. Each, I think. each field of, of research, with also with contradiction between yes. these different fields. Of and course. the question of unconscious is also present yeah. in the. So maybe on these very appeasing words, we should stop this discussion. Okay. And thank you very much. Peter. Thank you. Peter.